thank you for joining and welcome to Lead Dev Bookmarked. Uh, Lead Dev is a global community of engineering leaders who come together to discuss all things leadership, team, tools, and tech. Bookmark is our bookmarked is our monthly book club, and this is our first event. Yay! Um, make sure to join the Lead Dev uh, Slack workspace. We'll take some questions um, and uh, continue the discussion there afterwards. Um, you can find the details at theleaddeveloper.com forward slash better dash allies. So I'm Susan, hello, um, and I'll be your moderator for this discussion. I'm a former COO of a scaling startup and an executive coach. Um, my specialty is um, tech leaders. So today we'll be talking about better allies, everyday actions to create inclusive, engaging workplaces with Karen Catlin. So uh, let me give you a little, before I start asking Karen some questions, let me just give you a little bit of background about her. Um, after tw uh, spending 25 years building software products and serving as an, a vice president of engineering at Macromedia and Adobe, Karen witnessed a sharp decline in the number of women working in tech. Frustrated but galvanized, she knew it was time to switch gears. Today, Karen is a vocal advocate for inclusion, a leadership coach, a keynote speaker, and the author of three books. Present, A Techie's Guide to Public Speaking, Better Allies, Everyday Actions to Create Inclusive, Engaging Workplaces, and most recently, The Better Allies Approach to Hiring. Welcome, Karen, I'm so excited. Thank you, so, I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. Um, so I'm curious, can you tell us a little bit about the back story of how you came to write Better Allies? Sure, sure. So from the introduction that you shared, thank you for my bio <laughs> there, um, people can understand like I had decided to do a pivot with my career. I was moving away from building software products to coaching women who are working in tech. Um, I wanted to make the tech industry just more a place that was going to be more welcoming to these women where they could really thrive in their careers. I wanted to pay it forward. Um, mm. And I started my coaching business. This was about seven years ago. And I soon realized I had a problem. I had a problem mm. with my business in that I had clients. They were amazing. I was helping them grow leadership skills, but they were all working in companies that just the closer you got to the leadership level, the C-suite, mm -hmm. the mailer and paler it got. And <laughs> with all due respect to the male and pale people or who have joined us today, it's just like, that's what the demographics were like. Mm -hmm. And I started realizing like my clients are facing these battles, these hurdles, I should say, um, call it the glass mm -hmm. ceiling, whatever, but these hurdles where they just, the, the odds were against them at being really successful. Mm. So I started like talking to a lot of people and realizing that there were so many folks working in tech who really cared about being inclusive, about helping people, not just women, but people from other underrepresented groups. Mm. Like, be, like I'm a decent human being. Of course, I want to be doing the right thing and helping people do their best work at my company, but I don't always know what I'm supposed to do. Mm. And so I decided, well, I have ideas. I have some ideas of how these people can show up and be more inclusive. And so I decided I wanted to make all of tech more inclusive. I kind of wanted to change the world. And <laughs> what's, what's the first thing anyone does these days when they want to change the world? You know, they start a Twitter handle, of course. So I started <laughs> Twitter <Love> handle. <laughs> Thanks, um, called Better Allies. That's the Twitter handle. This goes back over five years ago. And I started mm. tweeting just like simple everyday actions people could take to be more inclusive. <clears throat> Excuse me. Things like if you're in a meeting, like if I'm in a meeting and I notice someone being interrupted, I'll redirect the conversation back to that person. That's a simple everyday action, right? Or at our next company all hands meeting, I will ask what we are doing around pay equity. Mm. Simple everyday action. And I just started tweeting these things. I would get um, inspiration and ideas from the popular media, from like examples of things that were going bad in tech, you know, for example, at Uber. Um, and I'll just share with you when Travis, when it came out that Travis Kalanick, when he was still CEO of Uber, 
he was using the nursing mother's room for his personal phone calls. And so when I heard, read about that in the news, I of course would go over to Twitter and say, you know, I pledge not to use the nursing mother's room at the office for mm. my personal phone calls, you know, kind of unlike Travis. And then I would link to the news article. So I, I had some fun with this, I, but I was really all about just sharing these simple everyday actions. And the Twitter handle started growing in popularity. I started getting speaking engagement requests, like, can you come speak at our company? Can you come to our conference? And anytime I would give a talk, Susan, it, just, like, it would always happen. Someone would ask during the Q&A, they'd ask, hey, Karen, we want more of this stuff, these ideas. Do you have a book? And for, the, for, like, for <laughs> over a year or two, I was like, no, I don't have a book. I don't have a book. But I finally wrote the darn book. <laughs> and so I wrote Better Allies. Um, I published it just over a year ago. Um, and as you mentioned in the introduction, I since have published a companion book called The Better Allies Approach to Hiring. Um, so that's the backstory of how I came and kind of fell into wanting to do this work. Um, and I absolutely love it now. I'm so glad that I was on this journey and I, I stumbled into being an author to, um, to share these ideas and help everyone realize how they can be better allies through simple everyday actions. I love that backstory. I just have one more quick follow-up question on that. What really intrigued me about that is that you started as an, an anonymous handle. And I just wondered if you could tell me quickly, like how, you know, what made you start it as anonymous and then how did you move to the more public, you know, to get public speaking? I just am curious about that background. Yes. Thanks for asking. So anonymous, I mean, literally it was first person. I wanted to, well, kind of, I didn't mean to be deceptive, but I must admit I was tr kind of trying to be a white man working in tech. Like, I do this, I pledge to do this, I will do these things. I try to imagine if I were a male leader working in tech, what are some of the things I actually could do? And so it all came out first person um, and it was anonymous because I wasn't really sure I wanted to have it be me. I wanted people to think that this was one of their buddies, you know, one of their, their bros, if you want to call it that, but one of their people that they could really like be looking at um, and I'm not sure I would have gotten the same respect or audience if I, if it was just another woman kind of, you know, complaining about the state of things, uh, frankly speaking. Mm -hmm. So I did start it out anonymously, and it wasn't until I published my book over four years later that I came out that this was me, this, and I, I owned it, that I am the curator behind Better Allies. So how did I get these speaking engagements, you ask? If I, well, that's all it. You know where I'm thinking. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> So people, people would send a direct message on Twitter to Better Allies and say, hey, does anyone at your initiative do any public speaking? And I would read that and sort of smile, like my initiative, it's just me. I just do this a little <laughs> bit every day. Not, it's, just, it's not that big a deal. But, um, but because I wanted to remain anonymous, I would send a direct message back and say, yes, one of our contributors does some public speaking. We'll put you in touch with her. And then I go over to my personal Twitter account and send them a message and say, hey, I'm Karen Catlin. I contribute to Better Allies. I love public speaking. What do you have in mind? And so that's how it started. I would not ever say on stage that I was the voice behind all of this. I would just start presenting the information, the Better Allies approach, um, and teach people about this, um, these, these ideas, these actions they could take. Um, and it wasn't, again, until I, I wrote the book that I came out as I am the person behind it all. So that was the whole transition. That's so fascinating. I, I just love hearing the backstory, especially when someone tells me they started from an anonymous and then it got bigger. I, I think it's really interesting because there's lots of reasons why we might want to be anonymous, particularly with the topic that you're talking about because of the influence and the way people might perceive it. So fan, fantastic. Okay, great. Thanks for the background. So um, in the book, you define privilege and how privilege is not limited to um, straight white guys. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm wondering if you can tell us more about privilege in the workplace and how it shows up, um, especially as we work remotely because of the pandemic. Yeah, yes. Okay, so first of all, the word privilege, we often get defensive when our privilege is pointed out to us. And mm -hmm. I certainly have felt this before in the past. I can think back on times where someone might say, well, Karen, you've got it so easy because you have a computer science degree from a well-known university, for example. My thinking and the defensive thinking that I start going through in my head is, hey, wait a second. Like, yeah, I have that degree, but 
first of all, I had to work hard to get to school, to get accepted there. I had to work really hard when I was in school to earn that degree. I had to put myself through school. So I always had jobs, campus jobs, and I left with a lot of loans. Like this was not easy. So my point is when we have our privilege pointed out, we often get defensive thinking like people just think I've had an easy life. Mm. Um, and that's not what it's all about. Privilege is simply a set of social um, uh, respect almost that you get because you're part of a group. I'm a part of a group that has com a computer science degree from a well-known university, for example. Mm. I'm also part of a group because I'm white. It's just how we're born or the situation we're in, the social group that we're in that affords us certain privilege, right? So we shouldn't get defensive even though it's, it is natural to do that. And as I started exploring this and trying to understand privilege a little bit more, um, I came up with a list of 50 ways that you might have more privilege than your coworkers. Mm -hmm. And it's in the book. It's also on my website. If people don't want to read my book, you can go to better. It's great. I did it. Download. And do you remember? I did how the quiz. Had? You would keep, mm -hmm. Can I ask you? Yeah. Yeah, sure. 17. 17 out of the 50. So you are a white woman just looking at you um, and talking with you. Um, mm -hmm. But there may be other things. And so some of the things that yep. I started exploring were, were realizing, oh my gosh, I have privilege because I am a U.S. citizen. So working in the States yeah. means I don't mind quitting my job because I am not tied to my employer who's sponsoring a visa, for example. That gives me privilege. Mm -hmm. um, another sense sort of a privilege I have is I have enough money in the bank to, again, take some risk with my career. Um, I um, don't have to worry about, uh, you know, do I need to actually uh, maybe take some snacks from the kitchen over the weekend because I don't have enough food? Or mm -hmm. I can actually say, yeah, I want to go on that casual, informal team building event that people are planning, like getting together for a hike in the Marin Headlands this weekend, um, because I can actually take time. I don't have a second job I'm working or <clears throat> day, yeah. you know, kids I'm watching, or I actually have a car that allows me to get there, or I can afford to yeah. get in the ride share, right? Um, all of those things are privileged that I think that many of us just sort of loss over. It's like, well, can't everyone just spend a Saturday afternoon going hiking? Like, what's the big deal, right? So, so that's just an example of yeah. how our privilege shows up. Now, in the pandemic, and all of the work from home that we in, in tech are so lucky for most of us to be able to be able to do yeah. our jobs from home. I mean, that's a source of privilege right there. Um, and then sure. it goes on, it goes on in terms of, well, I am talking to you today from my home office. I have my own office at home with a standing desk that is very ergonomic. I have a great desk chair. I have great lighting. I have high speed internet. Okay. I am talking to clients and people um, in just in my network who like literally they are in roommate situations. Their room is their bedroom. Yep. They only have a bed in there. There is no desk. There's no chair. They, I mean, their bodies are sore. Like that's like a sign of privilege. Um, they might, uh, there are people who are trying to juggle um, homeschooling their children now and their full-time job um, and so on. Um, there are people who have other caregiving responsibilities. Yeah. So all of these things show up in terms of how well we can do our jobs right now and the privilege we have yeah. working from home and in the situation we have. So just again, if people wanna explore this a little bit more on my website, betterallies.com, there's also a, I call them mini posters. They're kind of just PDF downloads. But um, one mm. is the 50 ways you might have more privilege in the workplace from yep. my book. And then I've added a new one called 15 ways you might have privilege during a pandemic um, because of the stay at home. Oh, great. Uh, so you can go through that list next, Susan. And yeah, see that. totally going through that one next. Yep, <laughs> I absolutely am. I mean, I live in New York City. So, you know, understanding of privilege, and I apologize, everyone, there are sirens here. So I am trying, if I mute, it's because there are sirens going by still, we're better. But, but I absolutely feel that. And I'm going to take that. I will take that one as well. I love that. It strikes me that there's a lot about awareness, uh, like really becoming more aware. And it made me think about like how much of our work day is in meetings. And I'm curious about what you think leaders can do <clears throat> to make meetings more inclusive. Right, right. So there are, yeah, meeting, we do spend a lot of time in our meetings. Um, and so there are well-documented situations in meetings that are not inclusive. And in my book, 
Um, there's a whole chapter on this uh, where I'm talking, I share some stories, I share some of the research, and I share these things that we can do to disrupt our meeting culture that might be in place that, so it's more inclusive. Um, some of my favorite things that I'd like to highlight here are, you know, the interruption, which some people mm -hmm. call the man interruption. And again, for the men who are joining us today, um, this isn't directed at you. It's just like there are physiological differences between genders where men tend to have longer vocal cords, which make your voice deeper, more resonant, and you can interrupt, you know, more easily. I mean, it's just it's a thing. It's a thing that happens. It may be that it's just culturally more acceptable for men to interrupt women or non-binary people and not the other way around. The third is that uh, we, as women, and I know I do this myself, we often use qualifiers when we're speaking. Things like, mm -hmm. well, excuse me, do you mind if I say something here because I think I've got a point that's relevant. You know, we just like, we have all these qualifiers mm -hmm. and it makes it kind of easy to interrupt mm -hmm. us at times. But regardless of that, you know, what the reason, the underlying reason is, the root cause of this, when interruptions happen, people pull back from the conversation. And mm. over time, they're like, why do I even bother participating? Okay, so look out for those interruptions and mm. simply say, hey, I'd like to hear Susan finish her, mm. her point. Let's go back to Susan's point, for example, mm. if Susan was interrupted. Another thing, and a participant in a talk I was giving mentioned this, um, they said, if you actually retain eye contact, and this is more for in-person meetings, retain eye contact with the person who is interrupted, it forces the whole room to look back to that person. So that's a pretty cool oh, technique. That too. is really cool. I I'm totally going right. to use that. <laughs> yeah. And then in today's world where we were Zooming and virtual meetings um, all the time, um, one thing I just read this in a a summary of a focus group that Stanford University did um, mm -hmm. by one of their research groups. They said that in this focus group, the best practice that is emerging is when you have a large Zoom meeting, no one can interrupt each other, <laughs> but you, you force that by having a protocol of you raise your hand if you have something to say. And mm -hmm. so that prevent, that there's, there's a moderator who will go and call on different people and that stops the interruptions from happening. So best practice oh, there. Oh, good. Ooh, yeah. love that. That's great. Yeah, I want to move on to just a couple more questions here. Boy, the time is going so fast. It's like such an interesting topic. Um, another chapter that really intrigued me was the one on what you call office housework. Um, I think it's one that particularly is really interesting, but often gets overlooked. And I'm wondering if you could describe what it is and maybe, you know, um, a couple of quick examples. Sure, sure. So office housework is they, they're, it's t a task that needs to get done for kind of the health of an organization, something that needs to happen for a team's work, yet it's not part of someone's job. Now, when I'm giving live talks, I will often ask the audience, like, what are some examples of office housework? And people will shout out things like, <clears throat> it's taking the minutes at a meeting when it's not your job, tracking mm. the action items, planning an offsite for the team, um, ordering lunch, making dinner reservations. Hmm. So these are kind of administrative in, in nature. Um, and again, if your job description includes any of those things, then it's your job, that's fine. But when it's not in right. anyone's scope, it often falls on a woman's shoulder. And in fact, more often on a woman of color's shoulder. Hmm. Women and women, especially women of color, are asked to do more of these office housework kind of tasks. Now, in tech, let's think about what kind of the office housework is for um, teams, software development teams. They are things like someone has to write the documentation <laughs> or for the API, for example, or, mm, mm -hmm. um, oh my gosh, we're about to open source our code or send it to a partner. Someone has to clean up the variable names and make sure there's nothing offensive. Clean up the comments. Um, <clears throat> um, mm. Things like that. Or maybe even um, we need someone to... Um, be join an interview team, uh, interview board for another mm. team, or mm -hmm. train the intern. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the first time you're asked to train the intern, there's a lot of leadership that you get to demonstrate, management, all sorts of things. Mm. But if you're the only person every summer who has to train the intern for your team, that's office housework, right? So these are all examples uh, of office housework. And over time, I mean, what happens is the person doing the office housework, mostly women and women of color, they 
become subservient to other people who are their peers, mm -hmm. right? They're doing service for others. And also they're taken away from doing the more substantial work that's going to lead to their promotions um, down the road, their bonuses, however that's worked out, what they're, what they're evaluated on. There's, it I has a like real world impact on their career. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to one uh, software development manager who attended one of my talks, excuse me, <clears throat> and he said that he never, and this, is, this goes back about six months when we were all still working in offices, but he said, Karen, since <laughs> I heard you speak, I never leave a lunch meeting without looking behind to see if there are pizza boxes to be cleared. I used to just waltz out of the room and assume someone would come and clean up the pizza boxes. Usually it'd be the last woman standing. <laughs> I, would like, mm. well, I guess I'll bring these, these boxes to the kitchen so people can, you know, it's up for grabs. People can enjoy them. But this leader now said, I am always the one to bring the, the boxes from the room, the conference room to the kitchen. And I put the sticky on it up for grabs. So what a wonderful way to disrupt that kind of office housework is look to do it or set up rotations, set up rotations yeah. for, okay, um, it's your turn to, to moderate the meeting or to take the meeting minutes or to plan the Zoom happy hour that we're going to have, right? Separate yeah, I love that. It's like what leaders can do to sort of help out to, to change the distribution of office housework. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I like that. I think that this gets stepped over a lot. We don't even recognize it's happening. I think it's unconscious. We don't realize that someone take, is taking up the slack or that that person is always taking on the, the notes of the, the minute notes. But also, as you talk about in the book, when someone is taking notes, then they're less able to also join a conversation. And what, what are we missing? What is the whole team missing when we're missing that voice in the conversation? Right. They're a step behind the conversation just because they're trying to record it. Right. Right. And their attention is always focused on that. And, and actually, I think that the team loses when, when yeah. we don't have full representation of every voice in that room. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Anything else? Any other any other tips you think leader that leaders can do to pay attention to it, or or you know other best practices for them to help shift that? Sure. Another one with office housework is. So I mentioned research shows that women and women of color are often the ones who are asked to do this kind of work. Um, you know, if there's one woman at a meeting and someone needs to take the minutes, it it's almost like all vo all all eyes are on her to do this. So that's one thing that happens. But the other dynamic that happens is that we as women and people of underrepresented group working in a team, we're often the one to volunteer to do it. We mm. want to volunteer to show we're team players. We'll just like, we get things done. We're like, we are a team player. We'll just do this. So we volunteer. We raise our hand. I'll order the birthday cake. I'll collect the money for the, the baby shower gift that we are organizing. I mm. will do it. Easy. And so as leaders who are listening to this, please like look out for that. And if you have someone who is a frequent volunteer at these office housework tasks, consider taking them aside in private and giving them the feedback. It's like, I notice that you volunteer a lot to do it. That's so nice of you, but I'm worried about your career growth. And you might want to step back from volunteering and let other people take, pick up some of the slack instead so that you can focus some, on some of the work that is really more um, you know, career growing for you. Mm. Coach, yeah, coach I like that. Volunteers, yeah. Co co I love that, like coaching them and, and being aware of it and intervening when, yes. when necessary. Oh, that's so great. Um, another chapter that was really intriguing to me was the one on inclusive language. And I just wondered if you could give us a couple of examples on what you mean by inclusive language. Yeah, sure. Okay, so first of all, and this I know is controversial, but I'm going to talk about it. I, <laughs> so I grew up in Rhode Island. And as you know, Susan, many people on the call know, Rhode Island is in between, roughly in between Boston and New York. And we speak like we're between Boston and New York, like a little bit of a <laughs> tough guy kind of, kind of accent. And I can remember when I was in high school, how I, well, I can't remember how many times, but I'm sure it frequently happened that I would yell out to friends, Hey, use guys, let's get going. Um, mm. First of all, use guys is not grammatically correct. I know that. 
But that one guy. Grew up in Michigan. I grew up in Michigan. We said use guys too. Use, okay, so it's not. <laughs> we it's did. A, it's a region. It's an American thing then maybe. But the mm. point is that that word guys now, mm. I am, I've, I've learned that it is not as inclusive as we, I might have thought when I was growing up. Um, because a lot of women and certainly non-binary people as well just mm. feel like when people say, hey, guys, they're talking to men. And the thing that really, I, um, I show this in a talk, I have a picture of just a restroom. So think of a restroom door with the standard picture of a man, universal symbol of a man with the word guys underneath it. And if you were a woman or non-binary looking for a restroom to use and you came across that picture with the word guys underneath it, it's like, would you go in? Yeah, probably not. So guys really isn't as inclusive as we might have been you know, thought of in the past. And it's a word that I'm trying to remove from my vocabulary. I actually used it on Sunday conversationally. I'm like, I didn't mean to say that. I just apologize when I do. And I say folks instead, folks is my, my go-to. Um, people from the South have y'all, which works really well. That's gender neutral. Yeah, um, I love that. I wish I was Southern and I could say y'all. Y'all. <laughs> but folks, you know, folks. A group, whatever. There are other things, team. Um, but let's talk about some more specific examples for tech. Because mm -hmm. I started collecting these and realizing, oh my gosh. So um, an example is... Um, we need to develop a blacklist to prevent access to our service, right? Blacklist. A blacklist is something that historically has been used to prevent people of African-American descent from accessing certain things in our society, in our culture. Mm. And so it has now become a, a substitute word for just a block list. You know, we're gonna block mm. access. So we call it a blacklist. Like why not just use the term blocklist? We can start using that as, an, as a, just a normal term in tech if we're intentional about it. Um, another phrase that is um, offensive to African-Americans is, um, <laughs> okay, here's a, here's, here's a sentence like, okay, the master slave architecture of the database in the server room is configured this way, right? Master slave. Why not call it something instead like parent child or original replicant or something along those lines? Like be intentional. And I know it is in, it's part of our vernacular, it's part of our industry terminology, but we can start using and moving to more inclusive language. Um, and then I'll, I'll give yeah. one more example of um, non-inclusive language. Um, there's language we use that can be offensive to people, um, Native Americans in our country. And, um, because it, it, it's appropriating some spiritual terminology, some spiritual language from their, their culture. Um, and so how many of us, <laughs> just think about this, how many of us have been in some sort of team building event where it's like, okay, everyone go around, introduce yourself and name your spirit animal. Mm. Okay. I certainly have. Um, it sounds like it's a fun activity. There's, I've, I did some consulting for a tech company in San Francisco that spirit animal was part of their, like core part of their culture. Everyone had one, but it, it, it's, so it's, it's part of a religious spiritual tradition in, for many Native American groups, tribes. So instead, and I love this, um, I learned it from just a friend on Twitter. Why not use a phrase from Harry Potter and instead call it like, everyone go around, introduce yourself and name your Patronus. Okay. Yeah. Harry Potter fans out there, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so it's just another way to, um, again, shift language to be more inclusive. Yeah, mine is, my Patronus is an avocado. Um. <laughs> we'll have to talk about that more later. <laughs> I want another I backstory to that avocado. <laughs> I, I, I love that. I think that that's really good in how, language can just become part of our vernacular and we don't really recognize the implications, particularly if we're not a part of that, that group potentially. So it's just a nice reminder to sort of look at our language and think about those things. And as leaders to think about the language that we're modeling and we're using yes. for our folks. Um, I wanna ask one more question before we go to the audience questions. Um, because of the pandemic, Many organizations are having to slash their operating budgets to survive the cr to, to survive the crisis, um, and I'm wondering: is this the right time to be concerned about 
inclusion, they might be wondering, right? Especially with all those pressing business concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so <laughs> the thing here is, um, couple, I have a couple thoughts. One is that because we are forced into this situation that we're all grappling with, and it's hard, but <laughs> we are innovating quite quickly on how we are living, how we are working, and all sorts of things. We're innovating, we're trying out different things, we're figuring out what works. And I am hopeful that part of figuring out what works will mean that we are more inclusive as you know, work groups, as companies, as society moving forward. Because so much of what we're seeing with this pandemic is we, we know it's um, impacting people from traditionally um, underrepresented groups more than others. People of color in, in the United States, um, for example, are um, experiencing so much more impact. And a lot of that is because of systemic bias. So anyway, I'm hopeful that we can, we can emerge from this with some changes that will be more equitable and fair to people around the world. But the other thing, and I know so many people in tech, myself included, are data-driven. There is data showing that companies from the last recession during 2006, 7, 8, mm. companies during that time frame who maintained a focus on diversity and inclusion who made sure that they, let, they, they emerged from that crisis, the recession, with their diverse talent in place, they were more able to survive and basically recover after that recession. So there's data showing that this is not just like, well, we should do it because we're decent human beings. It feels like a moral imperative. It's the right thing to do. There's business reasons for doing this, that if you keep a focus on being um, being inclusive, I'm making sure you have a diverse workforce, that your business is going to be more likely to um, survive this and ride it out and then be successful on the other end. Yeah, it's such, it's such a good point. All of, there's lots of research that shows this across the board. So that's great. And thanks for, I love even to the research on the last you know, recession. Recession. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, this next question actually from our audience kind of relates. So I'd love to go to this one. Um, what are your recommendations for being a better ally during the current lockdown, especially when many are facing uncertainty and additional pressures outside of work? I know, I know. Such, such a good such, question. <laughs> it is such a good question. And, you know, I just read in the Harvard Business Review last week, um, someone had done a survey of leaders in a very, you know, just it was last month, I believe. Um, actually, not leaders, employees. Employees. They'd done a survey of employees and found that of their respondents to the survey, 40%, 40 40% said their manager had not gotten in touch with them to ask them how they were doing, okay? And we all, you know, to different levels of, um, to different degrees, we're all trying to figure out how we live in this situation that we're all in. And for a manager not to just check in and say, you know, how are things going for you? Is there something that I can be doing to make sure that you are able to get your work done? Just like that kind of a check-in, 40%, almost half, said they, their managers were not doing it. So step one yeah. I recommend is check in with your employees if you haven't done that. Um, there may be some very simple things that you can do to adjust workload or figure something out that is going to make them more able to do their work. But maybe it's just that human connection of my manager cares about me and is asking about this. Yeah. That will help. Yep. Yeah. So I've heard that. It's in my DMs and in my talks with leaders. You know, I've, I've absolutely heard that. And it's sometimes the simple things. We think it has to be bigger, big or complex and we don't know where to start. But I love that idea of simple, like, how are you doing? Like, how are you, how are you doing? doing? How are you doing? Yeah. I love that. It's, that's really a great suggestion. Okay, one more question from the audience. Um, another great one. Um, after understanding that being an ally is a journey and becoming an ambassador um, is not that straightforward, um, you know, to how, how to better position themselves, let's say as a white male leaders, as allies in progress or open to learn and adapt without risking sounding naive, presumptuous, or not being an ally at all, right? Like, how do they navigate that line? Yes. Okay. So, in my book, and I have this like in my newsletter every week, being an ally is a journey. 
Okay. And it's a journey I'm on myself. Um, I'm learning all the time, all the time. And I make mistakes. Um, you know, I made some flippant comment. It wasn't even, I didn't even think it was that bad about, um, something about like with everybody working at home, I, I think I tweeted something with everyone working at home and then in parentheses, thank you, coronavirus, blah, blah, blah. Um, and someone called me on that. It's like, don't diminish this, like what's going on. This is a real problem. You're making light of it. And I'm like, okay, thank you. And I responded saying, well, that wasn't my intention. I was trying to be just more factual, but I appreciate, and this is, I mean, I just admit it. It's mm. like, I appreciate that you gave me this feedback and I learned from it. That's my go-to is I learn from it. And I do learn from it. I've learned that I need to be a little bit more cautious about, you know, making fun of the coronavirus. Like that shouldn't be part of my, um, it's not part of my brand to um, poke fun at different things like that. Um, so, mm. and I make other mistakes, I do. And so I apologize, I say I learn. And I might ask some follow-up questions or state what I'm going to be doing differently. So take that as hopefully guidance in how to navigate this moving forward. We will make mistakes. We have an opportunity to learn from them and we have an opportunity to act differently going forward in whatever capacity that means for you. I love that. It strikes me too that like there was a piece about being open, that you were open to that feedback mm -hmm. when, when you got it and were able to do something different because of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's, and it's something we can all do and we should do. It's hard, right? Sometimes when you get feedback and you're like, Oh, and then you have that moment where you want to get defensive. Yes. And if you can maybe be open to that feedback and lean into what they're saying or, or ponder it, maybe there's learning yeah. for us there too. Exactly. And I'll say, I also learned something, um, a great phrase to use at times, which really diffuses situations. Um, hmm. and the phrase is, um, you know, I used to think that too. Mm. And this is what I've learned since then. So you kind of make a connection with someone like really guys is that why, why can't we use guys, Karen, really? And I can say, you know, I used to think that too, but here's what I've learned. So another, that's just an idea of something you can apply in an everyday kind of way where appropriate. I love that. It's so fantastic. Thank you so much. It was so great to hear about your book and your thoughts about it. I thoroughly enjoyed not only the book, but talking about it with you. Thank um, you, Susan. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for watching the interview. Uh, I hope you got as much out of it too. Um, the next part of the discussion will take place on the bookmarked channel on Slack. Um, Karen will be there to answer questions and engage in group conversation about the book. So please join us over there. Um, and Lead Dev, Lead Dev Bookmarked is a monthly um, book club. Uh, next month, we'll be talking um, with Pat Kua about talking with tech leads. Um, and in July, we'll have um, feedback and other dirty words um, by M. Tamara Chandler and Laura Dowling Grealish. Hopefully I said everyone's names correctly. Um, but thank you again, everyone, for being here. Um, and we'll see you on the next event. Thank you.